They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We can't say for sure whether or not that's true, but the road to a world war, environmental devastation, and a drunken populace certainly are. While nobody can accurately predict the future and all possible ramifications of a decision, much of history has been shaped by the unintended consequences of these decisions rather than by the intended outcome. Today we'll be looking at four times the best laid plans had disastrous consequences. Back in 1917, things were going pretty great for Germany. They had made the bold move of declaring war against the entire world, and they were actually winning. By the end of 1917, morale in Germany was at an all-time high. This wouldn't last, though, as Allied forces on the Western Front would eventually overwhelm German forces and push them into surrender. But the Eastern Front had already been dealt with. Although Russia did not officially withdraw from the war until the signing of the Treaty of brest litovsk in early 1918, internal strife within the Russian Empire had left them unable to maintain an effective military. In February of 1917, Russia's February Revolution resulted in Tsar Nicholas II abdicating the throne. A new government was put in place for the short-lived Russian Republic, but this revolution brought with it an opportunity. The Marxist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin had been exiled to Siberia in 1897, and after his three-year exile, Lenin moved to Western Europe. When revolution broke out in Russia, he saw an opportunity to return to his home country. But there was a problem. Nearly all transportation to Russia was blocked off because of the war, so his only help was to try and negotiate passage with the German government. The Germans were very amenable to Lenin's request because they, too, saw an opportunity. The revolution had thrown Russia into disorder, but they were still engaged in the war. Allowing the Bolshevik leader to travel east could create enough chaos to force the Russian Empire to withdraw from the war entirely, allowing Germany to fight on a single front. This opportunity seemed too good to ignore, and so 32 Russian citizens, including Lenin and his wife, were allowed to travel by train through Germany into Russia. At first, this seemed like a great idea to the Germans. Within months of arriving, Lenin, acting as leader of the Bolshevik party, led the October Revolution. Germany had expected this to further destabilize Russia, but the revolution was far more successful than anything the Bolsheviks could have imagined. Lenin was head of the nation's new socialist government before the year had even ended. A few months after taking power, Lenin agreed to the aforementioned treaty, as he believed that the Russians were tired of fighting and that war would hurt the cause of international socialism. But what resulted was nothing like the Germans had intended. Germany had wanted to destabilize Russia, leaving them with a weak and ineffective government so they would no longer be capable of waging war. Instead, they escorted Lenin directly into power as head of Soviet Russia. Within just five years, he would form the Soviet Union, which went on to be one of the most powerful nations in the world and one of Germany's biggest rivals during the next war. The Germans weren't the only ones to make a giant mistake in the 1910s. The Central Powers were defeated in 1918, and in 1919, the official terms of surrender were ratified in the Treaty of Versailles. The Central Powers had been thoroughly defeated and had no choice but to agree to anything that was asked of them, which included Article 231 of the treaty, also known as the War Guilt Clause. This clause specified that Germany and its allies had to accept full responsibility for causing the war. As such, they would pay reparations to the allies and essentially foot the bill for the entire war on both sides. In addition to financial obligations, the treaty also required Germany to give up territory and limited its military. They were allowed to have a standing army of no more than 100,000 soldiers and their warships were all to be scrapped by the allies. The German naval fleet was interned at Scapa Flow in Switzerland during the negotiations, and when it became clear that the treaty would be signed, the German admiral ordered his officers to sink their ships rather than letting them fall into Allied hands. That was Germany's first act in defiance of the treaty, which was not technically signed when the ships were scuttled, but it would be far from their last. While the Allied nations sought to weaken Germany so that there could never be a repeat of World War I, they pushed too hard. The financial reparations were calculated based on what the Allies reasonably believed that Germany could pay, which was 33 billion US dollars, or nearly 600 billion US dollars today. They were even given the option to pay in kind, meaning Germany could pay off their bill with coal, timber, or by repairing buildings that they had destroyed. 
the initial number was even reduced because of Germany's economic hardships. Despite these considerations made by the Allies, the sum was simply too high. Only the first cash payment was made in full, with subsequent payments both in cash and in kind falling short. Allied forces remained insistent that the Germans pay their excessive war debts, so French and Belgian forces were sent to Germany to retrieve coal payments. The German coal workers took part in what was referred to as passive resistance, where they refused to work or listen to orders, thus preventing the coal payments to the Allies. The workers were financially supported by the German government, but doing this required them to print currency and plunge Germany into a period of hyperinflation. The treaty was already universally reviled by the German people, and seeing how badly it was affecting their economy only made things worse. Hyperinflation led to social unrest and political instability, which was the perfect breeding ground for extremist groups like the Nazi Party to recruit new members. By trying to prevent Germany from ever becoming a threat on the global stage again, the Allies inadvertently created the perfect conditions to allow Hitler's rise to power, ushering in World War II. The idea of refrigeration goes back to ancient times, though devices used back then were a far cry from what we have today. The first machines resembling modern refrigerators were built in 1834. These machines utilized vapor compression refrigeration systems, a process of cooling that is still actually commonly used today. But there was one main difference, which was the gases that were used to provide cooling. Back in the 1800s, there were only three real options for coolants. The first was carbon dioxide. This was by far the safest option, but it was also the least efficient. And back then, refrigeration was just for industrial or commercial use. The first home refrigerator wasn't invented until 1913. As such, carbon dioxide had to be ruled out in favor of more effective forms of cooling. The next options were methyl ether and methyl chloride. They were much more effective, but they were also extremely flammable, which posed a significant safety risk. And finally, there was ammonia and sulfur dioxide. These gases were also much more efficient coolants than carbon dioxide, but they were also highly toxic to humans. Since the safe option wasn't practical, this meant that all refrigeration systems built for nearly a hundred years were either highly toxic or highly flammable. It wasn't an ideal scenario by any means. While refrigeration leaks weren't exactly common, they also were not particularly rare, and every single leak had the potential to claim numerous lives. Ammonia is still used as a coolant in some industrial refrigeration systems today, and it's not uncommon for a leak to result in dozens or more deaths. In 1928, hoping to find a better solution for the problem, American mechanical and chemical engineer Thomas Midgley invented dichlorofluoromethane, also known as Freon. This was a much safer alternative, which Midgley demonstrated in the most theoretical manner possible at a 1930 American Chemical Society conference. There were fears that, like other refrigerants, Freon would be the flammable or toxic. To allay these fears, Midgley went on stage with a vial of Freon that he brought to the boil. He then inhaled the vapors from the boiling liquid and blew out a candle. So, what could go wrong? Midgley had invented a non-toxic, non-flammable alternative for refrigeration systems. The compound was a highly effective coolant, it made home refrigerators much more affordable, and leaks now carried virtually no risk. There was a small risk that a large leak of Freon or other CFCs in a confined space could result in cardiac arrest or suffocation, but the circumstances in which that could happen were extremely rare. The issue didn't arise until the end of World War II. Although Midgley had only intended for Freon to be used as a coolant, he was an employee of General Motors. And GM liked making money. They searched for other applications of Freon that could increase their revenues, and it was discovered that it could be used as a propellant in everything from fire extinguishers to spray paint to deodorant. This didn't start taking place until the 1940s, a few years after Midgley had passed away. Had he been alive, he potentially could have foreseen the dangers of these applications. Freon was invented for use in a closed system. The gas was never supposed to escape from the refrigeration system, and gas from old broken machines could even be extracted and reused with a high level of effectiveness. If that's all it was used for, it's unlikely anything bad would have happened. But with CFCs appearing in aerosol cans, they were suddenly being ejected into the atmosphere in large quantities. This resulted in a complex series of chemical interactions, but the most important step is that chlorine molecules from the CFCs that had broken off would steal oxygen molecules from ozone, creating chlorine monoxide and oxygen. Although the world was completely unaware of this happening, it was revealed to the public in 1985 that the abundance of CFCs released into the atmosphere had created a large hole in the ozone layer. 
When the RMS Titanic sank on April the 14th, 1912, it was naturally a pretty big deal. Despite the media portraying it as an unsinkable ship, it collided with an iceberg and sank to the ocean floor, where it would remain hidden for over 70 years. There were a lot of questions about how such a disaster could have transpired in the first place. But there was another, much more pressing question. Why weren't there enough lifeboats? Now, to be fair, people aboard the Titanic weren't taking the crash seriously when it first happened, and the early lifeboats departed the ship before reaching full capacity, so a full complement of lifeboats was not going to be enough to save all of the passengers anyway. But even if passengers were late to take the threat to their lives seriously, far more could have survived had there been an adequate amount of lifeboats on board, and this mistake was deemed unacceptable. In their eventual response to the Titanic, the United States Congress passed the Act to Promote the Welfare of American Seamen, or the Seamen's Act. There were numerous regulations imposed by the 1915 Act, but one of the most important was a strict regulation that ships could not leave port without enough lifeboats for every person on board. Many ship owners found this to be expensive and unnecessary, but for the passenger steamers used on the Great Lakes, there was a much more practical concern. These steamers were already extremely top-heavy. One might even argue that they were dangerously top-heavy. These ships already had strict limits on the maximum number of passengers, and they were now faced with the choice of either adding more lifeboats or limiting passengers even further. The latter was not an option if these gargantuan steamers were going to remain financially viable, so more weight was piled on top of the already top-heavy ships. On July the 15th, 1915, just three months after the Siemens Act was signed into law, there was a disaster involving the SS Eastland. The ship began boarding passengers that morning, and by 7.10 a.m., it had reached its full capacity of 2,572 passengers. The Eastland was moored to the dock when it started tipping over. The extra weight from the lifeboats was enough to make the ship capsize, quickly tipping over and settling upside down on the floor of the Chicago River. The Eastland was just 20 feet from the dock, and in only 20 feet of water, not even half of the ship being submerged. Unfortunately, many people had already gone below deck to prepare for the start of the voyage. Some drowned, while others were crushed by heavy furniture. In total, 844 passengers and crew died that day, nearly one-third of everyone that had boarded the ship. The new law had been put into place to make sea travel safer, but instead it resulted in one of the most absurd tragedies in American history. To be fair, the Eastland's initial top-heavy design was poorly conceived, but it had been operating for a decade already without those extra lifeboats. Those 844 people most likely would have survived. It probably goes without saying that America's so-called noble experiment with prohibition was an unmitigated disaster. Before being enshrined in the Constitution, localized attempts at prohibition had never been successful. People found clever ways to skirt the laws, and Portland's attempt resulted in a deadly riot until the law was finally overturned. Despite this, federal lawmakers still thought that it was a good idea to give it a try. Their idea was that by criminalizing alcohol, it would improve public health, prevent the moral degradation of society, protect children and wives from abusive alcoholics, reduce crime and corruption, and make workers more efficient. Absolutely none of that happened, yet the consequences of prohibition were far different than what had been planned for. Perhaps the most unintended effect was the damage prohibition did to the economy. It was assumed that since people would no longer be allowed to spend money on alcohol, they would spend considerably more on clothing and home goods. Things like theaters and fairs would see massive spikes in business as people looked for a way to entertain themselves without drinking. Property values would rise as the death of bars would result in more lawful and thus more desirable neighborhoods. And of course, they believed sales in things like chewing gum, soda, and grape juice would increase as alcoholics sought out replacement vices to keep them mouths busy. And again, none of that happened. Breweries, distilleries, and bars all closed as intended. What the lawmakers hadn't realized was that this would force restaurants out of business as well, as margins at restaurants are razor thin and alcohol sales were crucial to their survival. Thousands of other jobs were lost as well, such as barrel makers and truckers. Sales and other products remained stagnant, and the entertainment industry as a whole saw a decrease in revenue. People weren't spending their alcohol budget on other things, they were just staying home, possibly to manufacture their own alcohol. But the economic problems didn't stop there. Lawmakers in Washington were so busy ruling from atop their moral high horses that they didn't bother to look where their paychecks came from. Taxation on alcohol was a huge part of the federal budget, making up 30 to 40 percent of the federal government's total income at the time. The state level was no better, with states like New York getting almost 75 percent of their tax revenue from alcohol sales. 
This money had to be replaced with state and federal income tax, and the reliance on income tax to found the government has been one of the longest-lasting consequences of prohibition. Of course, while the economic effects were both the most immediately damaging and longest-lasting consequences, there was one other intended outcome from the 18th Amendment. More people were drinking, and they were drinking more. Exact numbers are difficult to pin down since speakeasies didn't keep meticulous records of their illicit alcohol sales, but it is undeniable that Prohibition did the exact opposite of what it was designed to do. 